Greetings and salutations, friends, and welcome back to more Warhammer Lore, where today we will be having a look at the most beautiful, yet also insidious and treacherous of the major remaining vampire bloodlines. The Lamian Sisterhood and their eternal queen, Neferata. This, as befit, a bloodline whose very nature is guile, subtlety, and subterfuge is a twisted and confusing, in many ways, tale. It has been written and rewritten at least three times, I believe, and so, as a point of warning, our primary source for this will be Liber Necris. There are more recent novels, but I always find the oldies to be the besties, and I find its story to be more internally consistent though we will lean on other sources as well as we piece together the long-lost past to find out where the Lamians came from, where they are now, and where they are headed, sat perched atop the silver pinnacle as they are. But we have a long tale yet to tell before we reach the Lamian Sisterhood's current home of New Lamia, the previous dwarven stronghold of Silver Pinnacle. As our tale begins where all tales of old vampire bloodlines begin, in the far south, ancient Nehekara, at the height of its power and at the precipice of its decline, ruled over as it was at the time by that most famous and maleficent of necromancers, Nagash. As he sat atop his great obsidian throne in his vast black pyramid in Kemri, Lamia was but a minor provincial power sitting on the shores of the Bitter Sea. But sometimes being small and forgotten about can be weapons in their own rights. Weapons that Lamia's king, Lamizar, was getting ready to wield. Nagash was uh, not a very popular king. <laughs> the great necromancer placing the needs of his own research far before the needs of his subjects, great or small in equal measures. The general populace of Nehekara had known wiser and kinder leaders, and the kings of the various city-states of Nehekara, well, they were getting a bit sick of the ever-increasing taxes and having their people stolen away to God only knows where, never to return, even as the oppressive Dark Pyramid grew larger and larger year by year. There was a growing feeling in the Hekara that the time to stop Nagash was now or never. The king of Lamia, Lamezar, seized upon this and would lead a revolt against Nagash. A revolt that was eventually successful after many years of hardship, toil, and warfare. A hundred years, according to some accounts with the great necromancer eventually being forced all the way back to his capital of Kemri, where his great black pyramid was besieged by all the other kings of the land. Eventually, they would break open its defenses and sally forth deep within its dark depths and multitude pits to burn the great necromancer and all of his creations, including his tomes of knowledge, his scrolls, his potions, and all of his research. Or, well, so everyone was told anyways. This is where one of our first major divergencies occurs. According to some scriptures, Neferata, or as he was known back then, Neferaten, meaning beautiful sun, had long been interested in the arcane arts, but of course only men could join the mortuary cults and wield the magic of Nehekara. As such, she was shit out of luck. <laughs> 
That is, up until the arrival of a mortuary priest by the name of the Soren. He and a handful of loyal acolytes had attempted to launch a rebellion against Nagash in the capital of Kemri, but they had been defeated, driven off, and had barely escaped with their lives. And now they were seeking refuge in the court of Lamia, which even then, rumours had it, was plotting some sort of an uprising against the great necromancer. Always in search of allies, of course, the king accepted them with open arms. What Lamizar did not know, however, was that Vizoran had not launched any such rebellion. He had been dispatched to Lamia on Nagash's direct orders, as he too had heard the rumblings that the king of the little provincial city might not be content with sitting on his small, out-of-the-way throne for much longer. Vesoran was intended to be a spy, feeding information back to Nagash, and also to see what elements of the Lamian king's court could be brought about to a more advantageous position. And in the young queen, Vesoran found a most apt and willing pupil. Forbidden from pursuing the arcane art by her father, she found in Vesoran a far more progressive and open-minded teacher, willing to teach the brave young girl in the secret arts without anyone else knowing. He was careful, of course, he couldn't reveal his allegiance so easily, but the young queen's thirst for knowledge was as insatiable as her other thirsts would eventually become, and she greedily devoured every scrap of knowledge Visoran put before her. And after the long war and the eventual defeat of Nagash, she spirited away a handful of his books and tomes and relics and other scriptures, and continued to research them at home in Lamia, whilst her father took up the throne in Kemri. Another tale talks about a son of the Lamian king by the name of Lahmizash. He had joined his father during the campaign, and that it was he who secreted away the documents. Not too fond of their father, the two siblings plotted together to unveil the mysteries of Nagash, and rule not just Lamia, but the entire world together. A touching tale. Sibling love and all that. But it wasn't to have all that harmonious of an ending, as Neferata's position within Lamia and Cambrian society still remained second to that of her brother. Now, Lamizash, her brother, valued her counsel and gave her far greater power than she would ever have had otherwise, but it was never quite enough. Eventually, she would plot to overthrow him, and he, in turn, would plot to overthrow her, only to be killed, leaving his sister as the sole ruler of Lamia. At which point, she was already a vampire. Let's stick with the Liber Necri story, however, for consistency's sake. She initially studied Nagash's teachings with the best of intentions. Well, that's good intentions that anyone studying necromancy can ever have, I suppose. The um, ability to cure any disease. The ability to heal any wound. The ability to cure, well, death itself seemed to have obvious and enormous advantages for the people of Nehekara. Obviously, this land was often plagued by droughts, by diseases, by plagues, by war, by death, by famine, by all manners of disasters. If she could, well, solve all of these problems, what was so wrong with that? It would benefit absolutely everyone. And Nagash had clearly managed to solve at least part of this problem, as he himself was, as was wildly known at this point, de facto immortal. 
Although the kings had put that title to the test quite thoroughly as well, and he was going to be passing it. However, as she delved deeper into her research, the Soren, ever in the background, saw an opportunity to spur her on a little bit. As things stood, she wasn't interested in misusing the great necromancer's teachings. She seemed to have no interest in empowering herself at the moment. And so Vesoran went to the other mortuary priests at the courts of Lamia. As she had now been given command over the city, whilst her father, Lamizar, ruled in Kemri. He began, the Soren, that is, to rile up the mortuary priest against her, saying that she was studying things that were far above her stature, a mere woman delving into the secrets of the arcane and magic. Surely such blasphemous disregard for tradition would bring disaster down upon the kingdom of Lamia and perhaps the entire nation of Kemri. She had to be stopped, but... She was still the queen. She had still been appointed by her father, Lamizar, and so they could not move against her openly. But the mortuary cult had tremendous societal influence, and slowly but surely, they began to chip away at her position, until there was nothing but tatters left of her reputation and her political power. Now, switching sides, the Soren went to Neferata and told her all about the conspiracy being plotted against her. The jealous mortuary priests were trying to tear her down from her throne for the high crime of trying to improve her people's lot in life. Leaving out his own hand in the conspiracy, of course. But, lamentably, the Queen's position had already been near fatally wounded, and her loyal Vesoran had not become aware of the plot until it was far too late. Clearly, the near do wells had kept this a secret from him as well, but not to fear. Vesoran, as ever, had a plan to rescue his Queen. They would stage a coup, you see. A false one, for within the many tomes of knowledge left behind by Nagash was one to carry out the most blasphemous and terrible of rituals. To awaken the Ushabiti, the ceremonial statues of Nehekara, in a mockery of their otherwise honourable form. This was something that Nagash had done as a last desperate measure to attempt to protect himself from the vengeance of the kings of Nehekara. This sacrilege had been the last straw that had broken the camel's back and had seen the populace of Kemri rise up against the great necromancer. Imagine if the mortuary priests of Lamia were caught doing the same. Of course, it would require the Queen to delve a bit deeper into the dark secrets of the world than she had previously felt comfortable with, but it had to be done. She was the only one left who could guarantee her people's prosperity, and if she had to commit some small sacrilege to do so, surely it would be worth it. And so, she did. The Queen's loyal guards were horrified to see the Ushabiti apparently advancing upon her palace with murderous intent. Hundreds of them died in a desperate defence of her private quarters, before the Queen appeared in all her vengeful glory and smote the statues to dust and cinders with her magic. Struck dumb by this, the guards didn't really feel like asking any questions, and as they were informed this was clearly the actions of traitorous mortuary priests that were loyal to Nagash, they immediately set about clearing all of the temples of the near do well traitors. And a few members of other noble families pointed out by the Queen's most loyal retainer, Vasorin, of course. And as things just so happen, after the dust had settled and the blood had started to dry, Vasorin and Queen Neferata had no more enemies left in the city.
soon the mortuary cult was to rise again, but with Vesoran at its head, and with a very, very different purpose in mind. Vesora knew of Nagasha's experiments to make himself immortal, but what Nagash had achieved through sorcery far beyond Vesoran's means, he sought to replicate via means of alchemy mixed with a pinch of magic here and there. Together with his queen, they concocted a new, true elixir of immortality, designed to wrestle their souls free from their bodies and place them somewhere beyond, as they put it, the grass of all gods and demons. Ambitious, but they were successful. They managed to create an elixir of immortality, which turned Queen Neferata, Vesorans, in essence, very first guinea pig, into a god. Or so it seemed at first, anyways. She was faster, stronger, tougher, smarter in every single solitary way. She was improved, infinitely so. But there was a price to pay. Unlike Nagasha's spells, which had managed to place his soul permanently beyond his body, this elixir of life required constant fuel to keep it there. Fuel, which of course, as we now all know, turned out to be human blood. Thus was born not a goddess, but the very first vampire. Oh well, <laughs> some teething problems still remained apparently, but all of the desired effects were there, and surely a bit of blood would be easy enough to acquire. After all, she was the ruler of an entire kingdom. How hard could it be to acquire a little bit of reddish liquid every now and then? Simple, surely. Indeed, an entire organization was set up to ensure the smooth delivery of that now vital sustenance. But Neferata's ambitions, of course, were grander still than being a mere pseudo-goddess, and so her court of undeath began to expand rapidly, as she blessed her most faithful and prominent followers. This, however, caused a little bit of a problem. For you see, in Kemri, where her father reigned with a wise hand, he eventually grew old and died. His son took over the reins of power and too grew old and died, and his son after him as well. Whilst Neferata didn't appear to have aged a day. <laughs> Suspicious. <laughs> you would have thought somebody quite so clever would have figured out some way to rule from the shadows at this point, so as to avoid suspicion, but no. And worse still was the dark rumours coming out of the city of Lamia, of predators stalking the nights, of a new cult of blood, rather than the traditional mortuary cult. A cult that had built itself an enormous temple that dozens disappeared into, but none seemingly ever emerged from. It would seem that Neferata's transformation didn't merely give her a brand new appetite, but rather a far more callous, cruel, and malicious nature. She probably began to see herself as a predator, as many of her court did as well, and any criticism, no matter how mild or surreptitious, was crushed mercilessly, until the Soren and the Queen were the only power structure that remained in Lamia. Even distant family members were not safe from her attentions. At one point, she even slew one of her cousins in an honorary duel that was not very fair at all, as everyone had known her cousin to be by far the better fighter, but for some reason, 
Her blade didn't work on the queen. Something was most assuredly rotten in the state of Lamia. The other Nehekaran kings began to plot against the unaging queen and her seemingly ever-growing family. As daughters, granddaughters, and other relatives seemed to live on forever, even as Vesoran too hadn't aged a day, nor had the captain of Neferata's guard, Abhorash, either. Fearing to move against her openly, they incited a revolt in Lamia, where the populace rose up against their rulers, reacting to rumors of plenty of blood-sucking monsters preying upon them in the night. Up until this point, the queen had been trying to keep the predations of herself and her new extended family at least somewhat secret. New and harsher laws had to be imposed upon the citizenry to ensure a suitable flow of prisoners to feed upon. Servants often went missing, and there were the occasional... Um, disappearances in the midst of night, and the temples themselves were an ever-present reminder that something was not quite right. But now, with a great public uprising on their hands, all pretense was thrown off completely, with the Sauron and the vampires revealing their true dreadful nature, butchering the populace by the tens of thousands, and dispelling any and all doubt that they had long since left mortality behind. Realizing now that there was absolutely no point in hiding anymore, Lamia began worshipping a new deity of sorts, as Neferata finally embraced Vesoran's long plan of seeing Lamia openly worshipping Nagash. A scheme that had taken damn near a century to complete. The Soren was, for his many failings and, well, straight up evilness, a very, very patient man. And now that the secret was out for all to see, his friends, compatriots, no longer had to be. The vampires could feed upon the populace freely, bearing in mind the need to replenish the stock, of course, and they could experiment with their powers to their filthy little cold hearts' desire. And there was a lot to be experimented with. How strong were they precisely? How tough were they precisely? Could anything kill them? What happened if they didn't feed? Could they control their urges? Was feeding not an option? What about magic? Was their command over the arcane arts heightened? What about their senses? What about their physical appearance? Etc. 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 The vampires had a great deal to figure out about their own powers, and they did so half leisurely over the years and the decades. One of the greatest revelations was that they could create more vampires without using the elixir of immortality. By taking their own blood, they could create lesser vampires, who could in turn create other lesser vampires. And whomsoever sired a vampire would have inherent and automatic control over that vampire. It was not necessarily absolute, and the level of control and power could vary from individual to individual, but by and large they were always predisposed to serve their master. And even if they weren't, well, their creator knew a hell of a lot more about being a vampire than the fledgling knew. And so, cutting all ties with your teacher was usually a very unwise move. The vampires also began to figure out what could sort of, kind of, pseudo kill them, as a vampire can never actually die, but their bodies can be broken, they can be drained, they can 
essentially be placed in a state of eternal suspended animation, where the vampire will be unendingly tortured by hunger and thirst, yet their withered flesh be unable to move even an inch. A fate uh, perhaps worse than death, really, and one to be avoided at all cost. And with the recent rebellion still fresh in their memories, of course, the Lamian vampires went to significant lengths to ensure their own safety and security, oppressing the populars ever further and ever harder, spreading yet more dark rumours wide and far in the lands of Nehekara. Eventually, the now rather distant relatives ruling over Kemri were ousted, as the other Nehekaran kings could not abide by one of such tainted blood sitting on the throne of Nehekara, as they continued to plot and plan against Lamia, but, well, the last war against a creature like this had taken a hundred years, and had damn near ended up in a defeat. The kings were very cautious, especially as these new foes, well, they were not like Nagash. Their powers might very well be damn near limitless. And whilst they were still wondering whether or not to declare war on them, something else rather interesting happened. The old king of Kemri, now having been executed for his familiar lineage with Lamia and his tainted blood, had had all of his relatives, sons and daughters executed. Of course, because otherwise they might return to try and claim the throne. It'd be unwise to let them live. However, the previous and last king, Lakashaz, had had a child out of wedlock to a mistress unknown to everyone. This child was named Vashanesh, and by all accounts he was a remarkable individual, possessed of a strong body and a stronger still will, and an absolute conviction of his own position in the world as the rightful heir to the Cambrian throne. He travelled to Lamia, disregarding or simply figuring that he could deal with whatever horrors awaited him there, in order to entreat the Queen's aid. For she was his relative, of course. Obviously, she would welcome him with open arms and aid him in regaining his proper place in the world. Now, of course, Neferata had long since forgotten or simply elected to not care about her lineage at all. She was far above mere mortal concerns now, and her family was nothing so ephemeral as mortal bonds. And yet, when this confident and handsome young man showed up at her court, she could not help to be intrigued, when he also ignored her taunts and those of her lieutenants and generals and marched directly up to her throne, to the point where the queen's personal guard of Horash, now also a vampire, pointed a blade directly at his throat, Vashanesh didn't even flinch simply continuing his march, forcing the captain of the guard to pull back. The armed vampire was forced to give way to a mortal. Neferata found this most intriguing indeed. <laughs> and if she could still be said to have had any emotions or feelings whatsoever, well, she clearly developed some rather strident one for this young man. And she ordered her court to leave them. She ordered her advisers, her bodyguards, her various followers and flunkies to all leave them alone. Leaving only herself, Vasoran, and Vashanesh in the room. Until she nodded her head at Vasoran as well. 
This was the first time in a hundred years he had been dismissed from his queen's side, and he realized that his position was beginning to turn rather tenuous all of a sudden, as his beautiful little puppet had developed a mind of her own. Neferata was no fool, you see, and she had long realized that Vesoran had played her like a fiddle for many a year, and was still doing so. She had agreed to devout herself and the city to the worship of Nagash, but she herself had never believed in him as a god, not like Vesoran did anyways. And she knew that so long as Nagash was the true god of the city and of Vesoran, she would forever be at best a puppet ruler, a provincial lord in Nagash's eternal kingdom. And she also saw Vesoran building his own parallel power structure to hers. His command over the Cult of Blood and what remained of the Mortuary Cult, for example, was unquestioned. Meanwhile, Neferata had built her own sort of sub and side cult, which just so happened to contain only women. But in the grand game of power politics, she was forever behind Vesoran. Vesoran had fastened his claws in her years and years earlier, and he had never let go, and she had been too afraid to show her disobedience openly, lest Vesoran decide to get rid of the queen that might turn into more of a hassle than a asset. But now, standing here before her, was the rightful ruler of Kemri, a powerful, young, vital, and energetic man that clearly had a great deal of ideas as he talked to her at length about military strategy, how to best survive the coming invasion of the other Kemrian and Hekaran kings, which now seemed unavoidable, how to reform her court, how to put a leash on her more disloyal or independent-minded subjects, and so on and so on. Clearly, the youth had some grand ideas, and he had a penis, which meant he was instantly interested in the beautiful queen, who offered him her hand in marriage. Eternal marriage, indeed. Vashanesh, still being a teenager, headstrong, and not quite knowing what he was getting into in all due likelihood, agreed, and was given the elixir of life, the full thing, not merely the queen's blood, making him as well into one of the oldest and most powerful of vampires. Though Neferata did entreat him to form a blood bond with her, with the two ancient vampires sharing their blood. This is a ritual that is somewhat akin to siring, in that it does build an enormously strong bond between the vampires, but it can also transfer elements of power, wisdom, cunning, and even to a degree personality over to another vampire. This is why a vampire devouring another is both a tremendous boon and something seen as an enormous crime in vampire quote-unquote society. And speaking of society, Vashanesh did not disappoint. Throwing himself full force into Lamian politics, he began restructuring every aspect of Lamia. Its military, its cities, its infrastructure, its peoples, its laws, its regulations, its court, and most importantly of all, the Soren's influence. <laughs> 
his cult, his power, and his personal reach. Even the worship of Nagash found itself writhing beneath his steely gaze, as Vasoran's position grew more tenuous by the day, even as he himself fought back vigorously with all the measures of political power at his disposal. As now equally matched, neither Vasoran nor Vashanesh and the Queen could risk openly defying one another. With military might, as all the other kings and queens of Kemri and Nahakara were staring rather suspiciously at Lamia. Several kings would come and go in Kemri before finally we see the rise of King al Khadizar, the Conqueror. A man with enough personal charisma, force of will, and military brilliance to unite all the disparate kingdoms once more in a unified whole of Nehekara, with, of course, the exception of Lamia, which believed itself to be far beyond the conquest of mortal men. Surely an eternal nation of vampire nobles could never be vanquished by such petty short-lived creatures. But mere men, of course, have one advantage that the vampires do not. They may not be as strong, or as fast, or as clever, or as tough, but they do breed like rabbits. <laughs> and that was the strength that al Karizar was intending to use against Lamia. Lamia had, of course, been aware of the gathering might of the Nehekaran kings. Vashanesh had expected them to attack Lamia at some point as a matter of course, and Abhorash, the queen's most loyal guard, had been put in charge of the military, along with Vashanesh's own preparations. Lamia was more than amply prepared to face down any army that Nehekara could possibly produce. That is, if they were facing any single army Nehekara could possibly produce. al however, hadn't rose to his position of power and prominence by taking undue risks, and so he did not lead the armies of Kemri, but rather those of Kemri, Zandri, Numas, Qatar, Marak, Razetra, Libaros, Bel-Aliad, Bahran, and Kasabar all coming on to the mountains surrounding Lamia in a seemingly infinite tide of manpower set to submerge the very mountains themselves. Abhorash, leading the defences in the mountain passes, fought valiantly, of course, but were quickly pushed back further and further, as his hopelessly outnumbered forces were placed in danger of being surrounded and annihilated time and time again, until he found himself standing atop the walls of the city of Lamia itself, with the only retreat path left to them, the Bitter Sea. With no recourse left to them, the defenders steeled themselves and prepared to sell their city as dearly as possible. There was still hope that the price demanded would be too high for the Nehekaran armies to pay. Abhorash alone was worth a thousand men on the field of battle, and besides his other vampiric lieutenants and the magic of Vasoran, tens of thousands of Nehekaran warriors were slain every single day, only to be raised into servitude and undeath by Vasoran. This came as a tremendous surprise to everyone aside from the man himself, as necromancy, at the point of raising the dead, was still an art thought to be commanded only by Nagash personally. Even Neferata had not managed to replicate this achievement, and Vasoran had shown no previous indication that he commanded it either. 
But now, with his back to the wall, he had to throw every trick he had out there in the open to try and stop the endless armies battering down the gates of Lamia. It was said that the ground outside the city turned to an endless, swampy, muddish hellscape with all the blood that soaked in it, and yet the armies of Nehakara kept coming on day after day, day after day, as priests and wizards both battered the city with their spells, their curses, and their miracles, slaying many of the vampire defenders for good with fire and stake and chopping them up into teensy little bits, from which there was no recovery even for a vampire. For seven days and seven nights, Abhorash and his faithfuls held the city walls alongside Vashanesh and their armies. But they were still relying on mortal soldiers, who died and died and died until there were no one left. Abhorash, Vashanesh, and a handful of vampires were still alive and seemingly unstoppable, but it didn't matter, as everywhere else the armies of Nehekara poured through the walls and began looting and plundering, pillaging, destroying, and burning, to the point where the people of Lamia themselves, desperate for any salvation, began to turn against their rulers hoping that some measure of mercy might be extended to them if they displayed the adequate level of zeal in taking down their previous rulers. With defeat now a certainty, the few remaining greater vampires with power enough to escape did so, forced to leave her court Neferata abandoned Lamia, along with Abhorash and Vashanesh and a handful of others, seeking out refuge in the only place they could think of, Nagashizar, where Nagash, the necromancer, rested. Unbeknownst to the people of Nehekara, he was certainly far from dead. He had merely been planning his return and in the vampires he had seen valuable and willing servants. He'd kept an eye on the Soren ever since he had arrived in Lamia, all the way up until this point. And in Neferata's new husband, Vashanesh, Nagash saw the perfect commander to lead his undead legions into Nehekara to cleanse it once and for all of the living. And now that the vampires too had a grudge, surely they would accept servitude with dignity and grace. And initially, so they did, although not necessarily universally. For Neferata, used to be the ruler, now became the subject of her husband. As Nagash saw in Vashanesh an incredibly talented commander, leader, and organizer, and made him so the leader of all the vampires, by gifting him an enchanted ring that would force all other vampires to abide by his orders. And if he should ever think of betraying Nagash, all vampires would be cursed forevermore. Now, this turned out to be a bit more of a loose definition of betrayal than Nagash uh, initially let on, but oh well, oh well. Neferata was not too fond of being pushed to the side like this, but with no option to resist the vampires led the armies of the dead back into Nehekara, leading legion upon legion of rotting soldiers to a seemingly inevitable victory, until finally al Karizar himself was surrounded, cut off by hordes of the undead. Sharnesh then stepped forth from between the endless ranks of skeletons and challenged the young king to a duel to the death. The outcome was already decided. Al-Karisar was a fine fighter and a brilliant tactician and a warlord, 
but he was but a man, whereas Vashanesh was by all accounts a god. He easily defeated al Qadisar, and yet, as the king was at his very last gasp, he threw out a desperate slash, which separated Vashanesh's head from his body. Now, dead, or at the very least as dead as any vampire could be, all the other vampires were freed from his control, and seeing their opportunity to GTFO, turned tail and fled. Not the enemy, not the Nehekarans, but Nagasha's rule over them, leaving only the Soren and his recently resurrected most favoured of lieutenants, Arkan the Black, left on the field to be overrun by the victorious Nehekarans. Obviously, Nagash did not believe for a second that his chosen general had been defeated so easily and decided to curse all of the vampires regardless, with the curse being that they would forevermore feel the bite of the sun as weakness to sunlight was not an inherent weakness of the vampires. Thus, having sacrificed himself to liberate his people, the Sharnish passed from the history books, never to be seen again, even though decapitation is not enough to kill a vampire, and certainly not one as powerful as the Sharnish. And indeed, he did not perish that day Although he is dead now, it just took a few thousand more years. But the tale of that short plunge upon a wooden stake is perhaps one for a very different day. Let us return now to our queen, Nefereta and how she behaved after the defeat of her de facto husband. Having realised that Nagash was only interested in his own self-aggrandizement, yet that she also had no chance to stand against him in combat, either magical or physical, she fled to the north, where she found new men to play around with the primitive tribes of what would one day become the Empire, Britonia, Tilea, and Astalia. She began infiltrating their ranks, but did not commit the same errors as she had in Lamia. Realising that to reveal her true self, or to build an obvious power base, would inevitably invite retribution, and not having particularly fond memories of the sacking of her last capital, she elected to keep to the shadows and start building a new power structure, a secret and surreptitious one. She'd also had more than enough of romance, frankly. First the Soren, then Aborash on and off, and then her king who had so cleverly betrayed her, even Nagash, the one who claimed to love all vampires and value them as his leaders, had thrown them aside the moment they became so much as a slight inconvenience. And now that she burned in the sunlight, she was not too fond of any of them, frankly. Men were clearly rather disgusting creatures, and the future, then, was female, as she built up the Lamian Sisterhood, whom she instructed in the arts of espionage and seduction. She spread these daughters across the old world, to become the wives, the lovers, the mistresses, and the influencers of prominent nobles, of leaders, even of priests, of cults, of kingdoms, of tribes, of city-states, whatever and wherever. In return, they would pass on their knowledge, their gossip, and their information to her, so that she might weave an even grander web. Eventually, she became so influential, and so wildly known, albeit as a mythical figure, that she saw the need to move her base of operation, as staying in the Empire was no longer possible. There were simply too many humans all over the place, searching out this mysterious lady 
who seemingly knew everything, this queen of the night, this pale mistress. Fortunately for her, there were other factions in the world, including, of course, the Dowie. The dwarves, who had established a outpost, a massive fortress atop a tall mountain known as the Silver Pinnacle. It was at the time a rich source of precious gems and stones for the dwarves, and the clan who held it, now long lost to the mists of history, must have defended it quite insistently. They were also said to have had a significant fortress built atop its very peak, and yet Neferata and her daughters took it in a single night. After this exploit, she was dubbed the Queen of Evil by the Dwarves, whom, despite lengthy and numerous entries into the Book of Grudges relating to her, very rarely, if ever, try to retake the Silver Pinnacle. Many other lost dwarf halls are the subject of, by dwarven terms anyways, frequent expeditions by bands of adventurers, mercenary forces, or indeed even entire armies led by long-lost heirs to the now defunct hall. But the Silver Pinnacle... Its reputation is such that even the dwarves tend to avoid it. Occasionally, a slayer who has failed to find anywhere else to die will venture into its lofty heights for an assured, glorious death. But by and large, the Silver Pinnacle is ignored, at least by those with hostile intent. Many a rumour still exists about the wondrous court that has apparently been carved into the very rocks of the Silver Pinnacle, where now an ancient queen lives surrounded by beautiful women and guarded by mysterious shadowed figures, and all of it in a rather unusual art style, reminiscent of a country far, far, far to the south. What precisely Neferata is even doing there is a question in and of itself. She seems to have retired from, shall we say, active politicking, like what she was doing in her old days of Lamia, and now she seems content with playing mistress and puppet master to her countless servants scattered across the old world. Maybe she has some sort of plan, a scheme, a grand endgame, or maybe, after having lived these many thousands of years, it's all just a game to her now, where she sets her own objectives to see what she can do, what she can get away with, who she can seduce next, who she can influence next. Maybe starting a war here, a conflict there, a hereditary battle over there. The game itself might be played for no other reason than because it is a game to her as she has not appeared outside the walls of a fortress for many hundreds of years, nor does she have any discernible plan in mind. Then again, it is entirely possible that our pathetic mortal brains can simply not fully comprehend the scale and scope of her design. Nevertheless, until the shattering of the Warhammer world, Neferata remained on her pinnacle peak. Always watching, always scheming, but by and large remaining one of the more harmless ancient vampires in the old world. Until next time, I've been Arch. Thank you all very much for listening, and I hope to see you all again soon. Till then... Have a good day.